everybody again to the third day of the training. I'm very excited to speak about the STEM pedagogy session today. And I know a lot of you have expertise in this area, so feel free to also type in examples or case studies in the chat, as well as, um, you know, during the discussion time to bring up, um, in, you know, work that you've been working on. So I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint. I my PowerPoint uh, Microsoft it crashed like literally like two minutes before the WebEx started, or the session started. So I'm hoping everything will be okay. If not, um, please bear with me and thanks for your patience in advance. All right. So let me share my screen. Let's, fingers crossed that it works. Okay. All right. It looks like it's working. All right. So as um, as many of you know from a previous um, presentation that I've done, my name is Deepa Shrikantia, and I'm a senior education and research specialist at World Learning in the head at the headquarters in Washington, D.C. And I focus a lot on early grade mathematics as well as STEM education across K through 12, um, the, the grades K through 12 rather. So, and my background is in STEM education, and so I'm very excited whenever I get an opportunity to work on STEM education and also interact with others who work on STEM education because we all learn from each other every time we talk. So, as a lot of you know, I generally like to start off my presentations with some type of riddle or a math riddle or a STEM pro problem just to get our uh, juices kind of uh, flowing right before um, we get into the more technical part of the presentation. And I know it's for us, it's Monday morning, so we've just come out of a weekend and I know that for many of you, it is Monday morning or it's a Monday. So I think just any type of um, brain warming or uh, warm up rather activity is really important for the brain. So here's a math riddle for all of you. So if you want to take a few minutes to solve this math riddle and then we can go over the answer and you can type in your answers in the chat as well. And as you start solving, feel free to put your answers in the chat. Okay, looks like Justin has an answer. I'll wait for one more answer and then I'll show the answer to the riddle. Do we have one more answer? Okay, I think I got two more. The chat is kind of flashing, so I, I didn't see the previous answer, but I think I got two more. So the answer is 47 cards. It's okay if you didn't get it. So one of the reasons why I like to start with math riddles or any um, type of kind of problem solving activity before we go into the deeper content is that it just starts to get the brain warmed up. Because if, if we just went directly into the content, then it takes a while for the brain to warm up and you may miss part of the content. So in a way, this is a nice activity. 
And I do this when I was teaching, I used to do this with my students a lot. We would always start up with some type of warm up activity like this or a riddle or, you know, some type of little quiz, but I wouldn't call it a quiz. And so they would, you know, they would always be like, oh, another time we have to do this. And then one day I didn't do it. And they're like, wait, wait, where's the riddle or where's the quiz? So I think it's nice for the students to get used to it. And then they look forward to it actually, because it does help them to get oriented into the subject and the, um, and the topic that we're going to be uh, focusing on. All right. So I think some of you got the right answer on this. Um, if not, we, if we have time, we'll come back and we'll solve it um, completely. So we can see how we got 47 cards. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about STEM pedagogy and pedagogy, as everyone know, knows, is instructional techniques that teachers can use, uh, any type of instructor rather, can use in a classroom setting to teach STEM effectively. And when we're talking about STEM success, there are three things that really do contribute to STEM success. And this builds on what we were talking about in the previous sessions, you know, everything from developing partnerships, to um, making sure that we really recognize the communities that we work with and you know, other, um, other externalities that we work with in the, in the countries and the communities that we work with. So in order for STEM success to be, or STEM to be successful rather, we need to have access. We need to provide communities. We need to provide students access to STEM education. We need to have appropriate resources and there is no um, you know, kind of right or wrong in the terms of resources in the sense, you know, you can have a lot of resources and then have too many resources that a child will still have difficulty learning STEM. You can also have low number of resources and that could be sufficient, you know, in order for a student to learn STEM. So I, I want to go over the resources a little bit in the next few slides and then really focusing on foundational skills. And I think the STEM centers or the STEM clubs or, you know, uh, corners a really good opportunity to target these foundational skills that students may miss in the classroom. And the foundational skills don't necessarily need to be learned through like rote memorization or repetition, but rather application of these foundational skills to, you know, robotics or to, um, you know, something about soil. And we'll, we'll go through an example, I think, but know that I will call on you later on because I'm going to show the video that you have from Nepal. So we, you know, there's different ways to reinforce these foundational skills and the foundational skills are so valuable for students as they progress in STEM or mathematics or any other subject. You know, at their, um, the foundational skills, what we notice in PISA and other TIMS and other international tests is that that's where the foundation, the foundational skills are rather the gap in that area is what's really telling in the results or the scores that we get across countries. So the more that we can do to focus on those foundational skills through our work, then the stronger STEM students that we'll get and the more interested the students will be in STEM. Okay, um, I presented this in, in one of the previous slides to a slightly different graphic, but just to kind of reiterate the, the ecosystem that students have for STEM education. So, you know, they have, we have out of school programs that reinforce STEM education. We have, um, you know, museums, STEM rich institutions, such as museums, families, schools, et cetera. So all of these different externalities really impact how a student learns STEM. And one of the things that we're working on is mainly out of school programs, but also working somewhat with schools and families. So, and I think also probably the STEM rich institutions, we can tap into that as well. But when we're working with all these different externalities, um, kind of just going back to the previous graphic that I presented on, the more that we emphasize the uh, foundational skills, irrespective of the resources available in the neighborhood or the community that we're working with, it will the students will develop a stronger interest for STEM, as well as have a stronger um, content background that they will want to go further in STEM, or they'll have a really good understanding. Even if they don't go into STEM, we still want everyone to be scientifically literate. In, in society. Okay. So here, when we're thinking about building on foundational skills for STEM, here are a couple of different ideas, and it's definitely not limited to these four points. We can add to it, but here's some examples on how we can do that. So one is structured pedagogy, and structured pedagogy is just, a, I guess, a, a term many of you probably have heard about this, 
but it's just a term to say we have um, a structure for how instruction is taught in a classroom setting. So, for example, we can teach something, you know, we present information to students, then we review the information with the students and then, you know, making sure that everybody's on the same page and then we move on. Structured pedagogy can also include having, you know, within a 60 minute time frame, making sure that the first 10 minutes or are about some type of warm up and review of the previous lesson. And then the next 15 to 20 minutes are about introducing a new topic or a new concept. And then the next 10 minutes are about reviewing that or hands on activity and so on and so forth. So you can structure a lesson, um, you know, based on that as well. So that's. Um, another way to think about structured pedagogy. Another um, example of structured pedagogy is to give uh, instructors or teachers uh, a script, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to follow the script exactly as it is, but just to give them the key points and ideas to mention throughout the lesson. So, for example, I've been in many classrooms, and sometimes I notice that teachers forget, you know, they, they have so much on their mind because they're, you know, balancing so many different things that sometimes they forget to just say good morning or good afternoon. So, you know, on the script, if we just put a little reminder for teachers, just remember to say good morning or greet your students in this way. It's, it's helpful. It just helps them to connect with the students or, you know, stop and pause, you know, at, you know, half point or the midpoint of the lesson and look around the room. Is everybody on the same page? Is someone looking out the window? Is someone disengaged? Is someone talking to a peer? And I think all of that is also very helpful just for the teachers to keep in mind because they have so much that they're dealing with, so much information that they have to convey within a short period of time. So putting some of those like reminders for teachers is helpful as well as the content information. So they may, you know, um, they may like different ways of explaining things. So here are three different ways of explaining um, robotics, for example, and so it gives a teacher a choice in terms of how to explain it, or they explain it once and they notice that students don't get it and they have two other ways to explain that concept. So that's an example of structured pedagogy. And then the next bullet point I have is, is expression. And here um, it's really allowing students to have the opportunity to talk about what they've learned and this is so important because oftentimes we we have very lecture based you know classes, especially in K twelve institutions, because of time, resources, number of students in the class. So there's really not this opportunity for students to, you know, just take a step back and then process what they've learned and to express it to either appear or apply it somewhere. So expression is really important because it allows students to. Um, you know, process the information they've learned and also to articulate it. And it doesn't mean that they have to necessarily speak to a peer about it. Like you can ask them to explain the concept to a peer sitting next to them. They can also draw a picture or they can write out and, you know, write it in an essay or they can, um, if they want to take a photograph, if that's accessible to the students. There's so many different ways to allow them to express what they've learned. And this is very important um, in, in, the, in the process of learning a STEM concept. The third point I want to present is solution pathways and in solution pathways, it's, you know, especially when we're working in the field of STEM there, you know, we have, we may have a right or wrong answer in math, you know, like 1 plus 1 will always equal 2. We can probably debate that too, but in another webinar <laughs> or another training, um, but. You know, there, there's different ways to get to 2, right? So we can, you know. If we're thinking about subtraction, yeah, Justin says could debate. Yes, exactly. So there's different ways that we can get to the number two. So we can also do three minus one. That gets to two as well, right? Um, two plus zero is also two. And there's so there's different solution pathways to get to that answer. And I think the more the opportunities that we provide to students to show that there's different ways of getting the answer, the more confident they they'll become. In, in STEM, math, and, and also in other areas, life skills. So when they realize that there is not just this one way that you know one person is able to understand or um, feels very comfortable with, there's other ways of thinking about the world, but I can still get the right answer, then um, I think that's, you know, it just allows for more confidence uh, in students and self-esteem. 
And again, when with solution pathways, um, having different opportunities, they don't have to necessarily speak about it or talk about it. Some students can be shy when they first learn information, which is completely natural, but they can also draw the concept down or they can sketch it or they can write an essay again. So there's different ways for them to express themselves of, you know, in terms of how they got that solution. And the last point here is multiple representations and just because we'll go through this in a little bit more detail later on, but students learn very differently. Um, there is a lot of researchers who say that learning is as unique as your fingerprint. And so the way that I learn is very different from the way Eric learns or the very different from the way Haley learns. And it's not that one way of learning is better than another way. It's just that we see the world very differently. We interpret the world differently and we can still get that solution, but we have a different way of getting to that solution. So providing those type of representations for students is very important. So some students like to touch things, you know, they're very kinesthetic. Some students love to see charts. Others like to talk to their peers about it. So you notice when you go to a classroom, very different personalities of students, and it's okay to have those different personalities because that allows them to learn in that way. So really um, tapping into that, and we'll go through some more examples on this in the next few slides. Okay. So I wanted to, in this chart, I basically wanted to illustrate that it really doesn't matter what type of resources are available in the community, you can still learn STEM. And the most important thing that we have to remember, irrespective of the resources that are available in the community or where the communities are coming from, you know, where their, um, their socioeconomic status, et cetera, is that we need to think about inclusion and social and emotional learning. And this is what really builds confidence in, in students as well as uh, the self-esteem for them to say, you know, okay, I have an understanding of these foundational skills irrespective of the resources that are available to me, I have these solid foundation or these co concepts, um, uh, this understanding of these concepts, and I can go forward. So really thinking about, you know, irrespective of the resources or the environment, kind of building that confidence. And so in the next few slides, as I talk about the pedagogy, I really focus on the inclusion and social and emotional learning in STEM education, which helps to build that confidence with students. Okay, so this is the roadmap that I'm going to be using for this training. So first we'll look at the different practices or pedagogies that are used in STEM education from universal design for learning to project based learning and then STEAM education, which has become very popular over the last 5, 6 years and the A stands for arts. And the reason why I've separated this out from STEM education is because arts is another pedagogical approach that can be used to enhance STEM education. So I've just separated it out for that reason. Then I'm gonna provide some examples of inclusive STEM programs of all these three examples that include universal design for learning, which is often known as UDL, project-based learning, as well as STEAM education. And then we're gonna think about how STEM can be more inclusive around the world. Right. So I'll first go through the first three uh, pedagogical approaches, universal design for learning, project-based learning, and STEAM education, which includes the arts. So a lot of the information that I'm going to present on universal design for learning, or UDL, is from our Global STEM Toolkit. And I'm hoping that the presentation of the information in the toolkit will also help you better access the information that's in the toolkit which is a really great resource on, on this um, particular topic. So inclusion basically means that teams work best when everyone feels included and committed. And like I had mentioned before, learning is as unique as a fingerprint. So the way that I learn is very different from the way Eric learns or the way Haley learns or any of us learns in this training. So we really need to think about that when we approach, when we have instruction at the classroom level. So universal design for learning is a set of guidelines based on scientific research about the way humans learned. And it's actually based on neuroscience. So the, it's very brain-based uh, research, which is very interesting. 
and it helps to remove barriers to learning and help um, mentors or teachers reach all part part participants. The reason why I've put mentors here is because that's what's in our toolkit. It can be mentors, teachers, it can be professors, whoever, but it's any type of instructor to make sure that they reach all participants or students in their classroom. So universal design for learning basically says that everyone has different, a diverse learning style, abilities, and interests. So one question to think about before we move on is how would you engage participants in your STEM center or corner? And how would you help them to remove learning barriers that they face? And just to kind of get our kind of brainstorm before we go more detail, more into details about universal design for learning. Any ideas in the chat? Like what are different ways that you already engage rather students? Because I'm, it's not to say that you're already not doing this. So kind of building on those ideas, what can we potentially add to that? Any ideas? You can put it in the chat once I see, okay. First find out about what the background is. Okay, the chat kind of came and disappeared. Let me see if I can open it separately. Yeah, Monica says, um, find out what your students, what's their background and work from there. Exactly, very important. Their prior knowledge, their prior experiences. Anybody else? I'll wait for one more answer and then we can go on. Any ideas that you have? What are you already doing that at Gulnara? You've written um, what, ha what they may be interested to learn to know. That's a very good point. Yeah, that, um, you know, students' interest is something to build on because then if they're interested in a particular area, then they'll be more interested to learn that and connect it to other topics as well. And Marbella writes in the Guatemalan context, I think there might be a need to build a building confidence first. Yeah, it's, it's, I believe, I believe that too, especially because STEM can be also seen as a very um, daunting or, you know, a lot of students are afraid of math or STEM, but it's, but it's a lot of it is a confidence building. STEM is taught quite traditionally and many people think that they aren't meant for it. Yeah, I agree with that. And Binod writes, uh, connect with contexts. That's a very good point as well. Um, contextual information is very important. And Justin writes, uh, it seems like the, in the first instances, social elements of engagement are going to come before the content related ones. That's a very good point, Justin. And Indra Mani writes, by addressing students' cultural values. Exactly, those are all excellent points, thank you. So it's not to say that we haven't thought about this and you know, universal design for learning is not necessarily a new concept, but what it does is that it provides us more um, instructional techniques that we can use in the classroom. And since it is based on neuroscience or brain-based research, it helps us to make a lot of the ideas that we've had much more concrete and formal as we move forward with them in the classroom. So I'm going to show a video about uh, this. Let me see if I can, I'm gonna have to switch screens. So if you can just be uh, a little patient with me, because I know that, it, that when I'm toggling back and forth, I may um, lose you for a second, but I will have you back in just a few seconds. Okay, so this is a video that shows This is a video that shows um, how universal design for learning works. So hopefully you can hear the audio as well clearly. Sorry, my computer has been very slow this morning, so hopefully it'll work. This teacher needs to meet a curriculum goal, and she's got a very diverse group of students.
and so does this teacher. And this one. Most do. In fact, research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers of today? Classrooms are highly diverse and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. Universal design for learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal design for learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, we mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Each learner in a classroom brings her own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. One for recognition, the what of learning, one for skills and strategies, the how of learning, and one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning, and a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique, and one size does not fit all. So how do we make a curriculum that challenges and engages diverse learners? This is where the word design comes in. A universally designed building is planned to be flexible and to accommodate all kinds of users, with and without disabilities. It turns out that if you design for those in the margins, your building works better for everyone. Curb cuts and ramps are used by people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and people on bikes. Captioning on TV serves people who are deaf, people learning English, people in gyms, and spouses who get to sleep at different times. UDL takes this idea and applies it to the design of flexible curriculum. UDL goes beyond access because we need to build in support and challenge. So how do we use the UDL framework to make learning goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone? First, ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I want my students to know, do, and care about? Then ask, what barriers in the classroom might interfere with my diverse students reaching these goals? To eliminate the barriers, use the three UDL principles to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. Number one, provide multiple means of representation. Present content and information in multiple media and provide varied supports. Use graphics and animation, highlight the critical features, activate background knowledge, and support vocabulary so that students can acquire the knowledge being taught. Number two, provide multiple means of action and expression. Give students plenty of options for expressing what they know and provide models, feedback, and supports for their different levels of proficiency. Number three, provide multiple means of engagement. What fires up one student won't fire up another. Give students choices to fuel their interest in autonomy. Help them risk mistakes and learn from them. If they love learning, they will persist through challenges. And remember, Always keep in mind the learning goal. Get rid of barriers caused by the curriculum and keep the challenge where it belongs. And that's it. Okay, quick recap. Show the information in different ways. Allow your students to approach learning tasks and demonstrate what they know in different ways. And offer options that engage students and keep their interest. Universal design for learning equals learning opportunities for all. For more information on UDL, go to www.cast.org. Okay, so CAST is a very good organization that has a lot of information on UDL. So I encourage you to go to that um, to that website when um, after the session as well if you'd like to learn more. But I'm going to present a bit more about their um, their work here, and we'll also include those resources for you so you have them. Great, so back to my PowerPoint. I always like hold my breath before I, when I'm changing screens today. I'm like, is it going to come or is it going to crash? Okay, yay, I think it showed. All right, okay. Um, all right, so let's, so we were, 
these are the different um, networks in the brain that you, that are um, used for learning. And as the video presented, this is from this image is from the CAST website. You can see um, the um, citation down here. So the first um, is the why of learning. So why are we learning this? So we're learning this because we're learning about water because water is something that we drink every day. It's something that's necessary for not only our bodies but also for the you know for the earth and the ecosystem, etc. So just to kind of you know put that idea in students' head because it really helps them to motivate why they're learning a particular topic. And that engages this section of the brain. So it, we don't have to go into the anatomy of the brain, but it engages a certain section of the brain that then we can build on. And then we go to the what of learning. So these are all the facts and you know uh, categories that we see. So like what we see, hear, read, everything that we're observing basically. And so all of that goes in here. And so um, here presenting information in different ways really helps. And another thing to remember in the recognition networks is that if you present new information to somebody, it doesn't matter, matter whether they're children or adults, there's really only a 10 to second window in which that information can get institutionalized or net, you know, networked rather into other information in your brain and stay there. So if you're learning a new language, and if I say, um, and if I'm telling you a phrase, I would actually have to say it 15 to 20 times for you to remember it an hour later. You know, most, I would say the majority of people learn this way. There are some exceptions, but just like that. So if you're introducing a new concept to a child or a student and they have never heard the word robotics before, you have to say robotics multiple times and in different ways. So then they can take that information and connect it to other information in their brain and it stays there. So it's not just like a fleeting idea or like just something that they hear on the side and they don't necessarily absorb it. So it's something to uh, keep in mind as well. And then we have the strategic networks and that's the how of learning. So how do we learn? We learn by expressing ourselves in different ways. Either we, we can talk to a peer about it or we can write down information or we can journal about it or sketch a, you know, a drawing or whatever it is, take a picture, build something with Legos. So all of these are um, important um, uh, networks to access in the brain and different ways that we can access them. Okay, so I think I saw one comment, but I don't think it, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, interesting why, what, and how of learning chronology. Exactly, yes, exactly. And, and, and I don't think it's, it's not necessarily, um, uh, you know, a new concept. I think a lot of it, a lot of us have been working on this for a very long time, especially those of us that have been educators and have worked for such a long time. We've almost been intuitively or informally working on this, but you, what UDL does is that it, it gives um, a more formalized structure to it and some more examples that we can build on. Yeah, but okay, so in their money, you've said that, um, but we usually practice what, how, and why of learning. I see. Okay. So it's kind of changed a little bit in terms of the chronology of, of the, of how it works. So this is the way that, uh, universal design for learning through cast, the cast system has, they've developed it and they've developed it based on the neuroscience. I, I also want to just mention that it is very Western approach. I, I know I usually don't like to use that word, but it was developed out of North America. So it's not to say that this chronology is appropriate for everyone around the world. And I know that the CAST um, organization is doing research to figure out or to determine how these neural networks um, work in different communities. So I think it is very important that you've mentioned that it's, we do have these three um, areas of learning, but sometimes the chronology might be different and the chronology might be a different for, I mean, the difference in the chronology rather will be important for different communities. So I think that's a very important point. Thank you for bringing that up in the money. So UDL, the reason why we, we talk about UDL in STEM education is that it has, and it's again, not limited to the information on this slide. It has a lot more benefits, but just to give a couple of ideas of the benefits is one is representation. And when we were talking about 
students having different ways to express themselves or having different solution pathways, uh, different ways of learning. This is really important because even Einstein, he didn't speak for several years. And then all of a sudden he developed E equals MC squared. And that's such a important um, equation in our world. So I think that, you know, these, we have to allow for, you know, people to, or even students to have different ways of um, comprehending, understanding information, even if they just want to listen for a very long period of time, it doesn't mean that they're not processing the information, but maybe they have to express it in a different way and not verbally. So it allows for students of different communities, different, you know, uh, you know, cultural backgrounds, traditional backgrounds, ways that, you know, children see the world, languages, et cetera, to be represented in STEM fields. It also provides opportunities for these students. So once they see themselves in these fields and they feel that they're confident that they have something to contribute, that it isn't necessarily a, uh, you know, I, again, I don't want to you know, point to North America, but it's not necessarily something that only comes out of North America, but it's rather a global uh, contribution that everybody can contribute to. They see opportunities and then they see themselves working in the field and they see themselves as peers with others in the world, which is very important, or even in their communities or in their countries. And it really brings out unique minds. And as I mentioned, Einstein, uh, he had such a unique mind. And if someone had given up, I mean, I'm sure people did give up on him, but he came out with this, you know, great scientific mind, mathematical and scientific mind. And so it just allows for unique minds to flourish. And so that's something to keep in mind. And it contributes to different skill sets. And as we know, when we're working with people, as we're working in society or even interacting with everybody in society, everybody brings a different skill set, you know, to the to a job or to a team. And that's really important, and that's how teams um, they they flourish and they survive. Is that because everybody has a different skill set that they can bring to the team, or to anything that's being worked on? And I think that's very important to recognize. And I just wanted to add one more point to that: is that when students recognize that, you know, people learn, or students, their peers learn differently, and they also learn to work with people who who learn differently. It actually will help them when they come into the workplace, because maybe the, the the pace at which I read an email is very different from the pace at which Haley reads an email. Not to distinguish the two of us, but it's more I'm just using Haley because I know her very well, and you know, so maybe she reads it much faster than I do. And so if she reads an email faster than me, then I you know it takes me a little bit longer. Then I'm going to take a little bit longer to comprehend or understand the email, and Haley might get it much faster. So, you know, if, if Haley and I were going to school together, then she would know, okay, Deepa takes a little bit longer to understand something. So I'll just wait a little bit longer for her. And it allows her to cultivate that patience and understanding at a young age that she can use later on. All right. So here's some examples of how um, multiple, I'm going to pick one of the areas, which is multiple means of engagement, engagement, which is something that we can easily do in a STEM corner or classroom. And so this is again, coming from the STEM toolkit. And I've just pulled out a couple of examples. And if you'd like to do learn a little bit more, I encourage you to go back to the STEM toolkit so you can uh, read a little bit more about this. So one way to engage um, different ways, rather to engage students is that we can use a hook to spark interest. And in, for example, in an engineering lesson, we can ask a teacher or a mentor to talk about the time they had to fix something that was broken. And we've always had, we've all of us have had to fix something that was broken, whether it was, you know, maybe a flat tire or, you know, maybe one of our watches or, you know, whatever it is, or a computer, we've all had to fix something. So it, it makes this, it makes STEM very real life. It's something in our everyday life. So fixing a computer is part of STEM. Challenging participants. And here we can, um, you know, for example, if to design a robot, a mentor or a teacher can break a lesson down into activities that have different degrees of social interaction and structure. And what this basically means is that, you know, we can have one part where the students are talking to each other about a certain concept or maybe they act it out in front of the class. They're like, okay, this is how you how you build a robot through pantomime. Or one of another example that I learned actually just recently this weekend, one of my friends was telling me that her dad 
who's a technology teacher taught coding to kindergartners through dance. So there's just different things that you can do to engage with students and really to challenge their thinking about it, but also to help them connect with it in different ways. So to further go on in this example, here it says, during the introduction, the mentor asks participants to think individually about questions they have about robots. During the guided practice, participants work in teams as a mentor shows them basic steps for designing a robot. Then during free practice, the mentor steps away and lets the teams experiment on their own. So there's a different ways to challenge participants and engage them in different ways. And then at the end of a lesson on designing devices to transport endangered animals. So this is a, one of a lesson, one of the lessons that is in the STEM toolkit. Um, a teacher or mentor can ask participants to reflect on how they did. How did you do in this lesson? How did it make you feel? What did you learn? What is something that you could take away from this lesson? And the mentor or teacher can remind participants that reflection is a key part of the design process and helps people improve their skills and techniques. So no matter what we do, even as adults, after we give a presentation, after we, you know, have a really important, you know, design meeting with our colleagues or we uh, go to a conference, whatever it is, we always reflect on it because we know that next time when we do it, we're going to have to use whatever we've learned from the previous time to improve ourselves. So cultivating that in students is very important as well. All right. So this is just an example of multiple means of representation and um, engagement. So this is a program that it's not part of world learning, but a program that I did uh, several years ago with some peers in, in India. And I have to just mention a couple of my, my pictures will mainly be South Asia context, South and East Asia context, um, because I've done a quite a bit of work there. So if you see um, those countries are presented more, it's not that I'm um, kind of picking one country over another country, it's just my experience. But here at this program, we had uh, students, they were working on a community environment project, and we asked them to go pick up um, basically trash in their in their neighborhoods. And then we talked about, you know, what type of trash they've picked up. And it's not that we asked them to pick up unsanitary things, but, you know, you can see here, someone has like half of a coconut shell and then, you know, maybe some like plastic items, a plastic water bottle, things like that. And we gave them gloves and everything. So it was very safe. And here we put them together in a circle. So we engage them in a different, you know, we engage them by asking them to go and, you know, collect this trash, brought them back, put them, put them in a circle. And then we talked about, why this trash exists in society, you know, or why does it exist rather in your neighborhoods? And, you know, what is it that can be done to reduce this trash and also to recycle it? So it was a nice interaction because they visibly, they, you know, visibly can see the trash in front of them. And then at the same time, they're talking to their peers and we had other engagements with them to determine how they can reduce the trash in their neighborhoods. It was a very huge group of students. We think we had about 80 students. So you can see there's quite a few students in this group. But, you know, even with this size of students, they had a lot of fun and they learned a lot in this activity. This is an example from when I went to Sri Lanka, um, and this was maybe about six or seven years ago. And one of the things that I, this is actually uh, an after school program. So it was not in school and something that might be relevant to everyone. And one of the things that I really liked about it is that it was so hands on and they used local games and local, um, you know, games that had been passed on from, you know, generation to generation in Sri Lanka. And they've also adapted new games as well. And can you hear me? Okay. I just saw a network issue. I can hear me. Okay, great. So they, they had adapted them to um, show how STEM or even math can be incorporated into them. So one of them is like, if you look on, I think it's the left-hand side for you, the kids are standing on like a checkerboard and they put numbers across the, you know, vertically as well as um, horizontally. And then the kids stood on them and then they would give them a math problem. And then the kids had to jump to the next, <laughs> to the number that the math problem solved. And these are very young kids, so they could give them, you know, numbers within um, 10 digits to, to solve. But it was so much fun. The kids were having such a good time with it. They they didn't want to get off of the board. And this all of these um, this is in a this is in a rural area in Sri Lanka. So they didn't have many resources. But these are actually tiles um, that were thrown out. Someone was reconstructing a home nearby, 
And these, um, someone in the school saw that they had thrown these tiles out. So they took them, they refurbished them, and then they made them into this board for the children. Um, they basically just glued them to the ground. So it's in a very le low resource setting, low resource environment, but they were able to reuse um, materials to create this for the children. And then the, the numbers that you see, they're just, you know, cardboard or just paper that, that have been laminated. So very low resource, um, uh, low resources rather that can be used to teach concepts. And, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, this is probably one of the most popular things that, that the children, they were just so excited. They didn't want to come off the board, as I mentioned. They were like, can we have another problem, please? Another problem. And I didn't never seen children wanting to learn math so much. <laughs> And then the example to the right, and so you'll see a picture of me. So this is a card game that um, these are the, some of the curriculum developers They were showing me this card game and it's an, a more advanced card game. It's about geometry. And so it's all angles and uh, measurements of angles. So they had created this card game that, you know, is similar to like go fish or, you know, um, I don't know if everyone knows what go fish is, but it's basically like, you know, you, you pick a card and if someone has a certain angle in your team, then you can say who has 30 degrees and you have to be able to recognize in the, in the triangle or that angle measurement, and then you can trade those cards. So they were showing me that, and you can see some of the materials that they've developed in the background. And a lot of these have been refurbished, you know, things that have been just sort of thrown out in the community. They took them. Um, and then they've, you know, made them into materials that can be used in the classroom. And this is in another area of Sri Lanka. Both of these are in two different neighborhoods or two different communities. Okay. And here's another example um, of UDL and Stephen uh, Wiltshire. He's a British mathematician and artist, and he's autistic. And one of the ways that he expresses himself, his mathematical understanding rather is through art. And he's been doing this since he was a young child, and it just provides an alternative way for him to communicate these concept or these abstract concepts of math um, in, you know, in his understanding of it. So I thought it was a really good example to share. Okay, so we are close to the hour and I just want to ask some reflections and then we can take a short break before we move on to project based learning as well as steam education with with the A. So I just wanted to ask if there's any reflections, thoughts, questions. Any ideas? You know, so we just learned about UDL, so you can even send me a smiley face. That's totally fine too. <laughs> Very good examples. Thank you, Benoit. Appreciate that. Good read. Okay, so Justin asked if there's some good resources to read more in UDL, and there definitely are. I can I can put together some links, and share them when uh, Haley sends out the powerpoints to everybody. Yeah, the Cast Cast is a very good uh, organization. They've done probably the most research and work on UDL. So, if you type in Cast UDL into Google, you'll you'll find their website. But I'll also share it with you. Okay. And we have Marbella says, I loved starting with games, which are much less intimidating and starting with students, starting with what students are already familiar with. Yeah, I agree with you, Marbella. And it, it almost like it, it creates a trust between the teacher or the instructor and the student when they, when they see that, oh, this is something that even my teacher has gone through. They, they've also, you know, lost their watch or broken, had to replace a battery in their watch. Even something as simple as that, because students can relate to it or like, you know, um, anything they had to, you know, fix something electrical at home. They may have seen with their parents or even starting with a game, which is really, really helpful. And Adeline says, thank you for the visuals of the examples of applications. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, Indramani says, UDL is as a wonderful resource. I agree too. I think it definitely builds on a lot of the work that we're already doing and it provides more concrete steps to go forward with. Justin says, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And Monica says, I like, I feel like UDL is something very familiar 
And as teachers, we already might, we might already implement some of these principles, but like you said, it gives us specific guidelines to implement in our lessons. I completely agree with you, Monica. I think all of us as instructors or teachers are also very intuitive. We know, we know a lot of these things, but it just sort of um, formalizes a lot of the concepts that we may have been working with. And Gulnara says, um, Great to see people are created with limited or no resources. I agree, Gulnara. I, whenever I see examples like what I've seen in Sri Lanka, it really warms my heart because I, it's just amazing what people can do with, you know, things that they, like, for example, that board that was developed for the students that with the numbers, and it was just refurbished from tiles that were thrown out in the street. So it, it really warms my heart to see that too. And Indra Mani says, as mentioned earlier, appreciate, um, why, what, and how, and what to add, uh, what to add one more of who of learning. Yeah, who of learning. That's a really good question. Yeah, I think so too. It's like, who are we? Um, uh, we can probably uh, dissect that a little bit more, but definitely like, who are we learning for and who, who we are in terms of our learning? That's, that's very good. I agree with that. Yeah. So why, what, how, and who? Yeah, I really like that. That's great. Uh, Darin, I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly. Is it Darin? Darin, the last example of Sri Lanka represents my context in rural areas where I teach. I love the example as an after school activity. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad. I'm glad that that example um, resonates with you and that's something that you could potentially use. Yeah, and feel free to unmute yourselves as well if you if you don't want to use the chat function. Either way is fine with me. Okay, well, maybe we can go ahead and take our break then for Haley about 10 minutes, right? That's what we usually give everyone. Yep, you're right on time, so 10 minutes is fine. Okay, great. So everybody can take a short break and um, we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you.